<laughs> All right. Well, we will call uh, to order the Franklin Regional Board of School Directors Committee of the Whole meeting for Monday, November 20th, 2023. Uh, we were in executive session from 645 to 732 for legal contract and safety obligations. Uh, roll call, Ms. Wolf. Yes. Mr. Moderator? Yes. Mr. Albertino? Here. Dr. Ethelene Rainey? Here. Mr. Wyman? Here. Ms. Altieri Hand? Here. Mr. Kersey? Here. Mr. Kowalski? Here. Mr. Yingling? Yes. Here. Okay. All right. Uh, we will move over to uh, the superintendent's report, Dr. Perana. Good evening. I'm actually very honored to say that we have a long superintendent's report this evening. We're going to be highlighting uh, great things happening with our students as well as recognizing our staff for some of their work. I'm going to begin with, without any hesitation. I'm going to turn this over to Mrs. Pope and Mr. Curran uh, to talk about our high school uh, students of, of the fourth and first quarters. Good evening. For those of you who uh, maybe weren't here last year or were, weren't listening last year, we started doing uh, students of the nine weeks that we would like to bring and recognize here at the board meetings. Our Pay It Forward Club, which is sponsored by Lynn Stallnaker, she requests from our teachers or any of our staff, any students that they saw just really exhibited what we do um, with five C's and having students with a lot of motivation and grit um, within their classrooms and to nominate them for an award each nine weeks. Uh, what happens with that is she collects all of these, makes them anonymous, so takes out all of the students' names, and then her Pay It Forward Club goes and reviews these write-ups, and then they select the write-ups based on um, some requirements for the, for the student, and then from those are chosen. So we have four students who are, we are going to honor here today. Um, the first two we're going to bring back from the fourth quarter, because um, we didn't get to do it then, so we'd like to still honor them now, and then we have ones from first quarter as well. So the first person from the fourth nine weeks of last year is not here because he graduated. So that's a good thing. But uh, we, do, we do want to take a moment to recognize uh, Mr. Joseph Thomas for his great work. And, you know, essentially the essence of his write-up is the attitude and effort that he put forth his senior year matched that attitude and effort he had as an underclassman. And um, one of the teachers that had recommended him actually got to teach him both in ninth grade and 12th grade, which is a pretty special thing to see that, that growth and development, but also that continued persistence. And I think that idea of persistence and effort uh, will be echoed here as we talk about some of the students that are here with us tonight. Um, our second student of the fourth nine weeks to end 2023, 22-23 school year um, is here, and her name is Miss Reagan Weaver. So a little bit of, a little bit about what people said about you, Reagan. Um, you know, her attitude and her persistence are second to none. She takes challenging courses and engages in them, puts in the work, meets, meets teachers during QRT when she needs support, pushes herself, accepts the challenge. Um, some of the words that were used to describe you, Reagan, were someone who is persistent, someone with character, and someone with dignity. So keep up the great work and congratulations. Thank you. Our first student from the first nine weeks is Ari Abiraman. Ari was nominated by a teacher that he knew from last year, and they were able to speak to the fact that he has come back this year with a renewed purpose and focus, that you have maintained high grades in all of your classes throughout the nine weeks, and you also show a strong desire to do well. You aren't afraid to reach out to staff if you need help or if you need something, and your work is done very thoughtfully and with the intent of learning. So 
So thank you, Ari, for all of your efforts this nine weeks. And our second student that we would like to um, honor this evening is Madeline Prince. I want to do this right up justice because you had a teacher spend an awful lot of time putting their thought into this, so just bear with me for one moment. <laughs> um, Madeline has impressed me all year with her creative answers and her willingness to ask questions. Earlier in the year, you participated in an impromptu speech exercise by creating an entirely made-up scenario on the fly, which can be intimidating to do when students don't know their classmates just yet. You use your creativity on projects as well, and when you're asked to think I'm sorry, and when you are asked, you think very analytically. More importantly, you are extremely kind. There have been two different situations that have almost meant that someone would be, would be excluded, but you always invite them. Recently, you invited four students to work on a project with you who would otherwise have to have broken apart and worked either singly or with a group of two. That being said, I think I got all of those pieces in there. We wanted to congratulate you this evening as well, Madeline. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and congratulations and thank you to our students as well as those people who support them and, and raise them to, to have such attributes. So uh, let's also give, give those special people in their lives a round of applause as well. So one of the things we're talking about and the board uh, has been talking about it, are ways to recognize our staff for going above and beyond to, to exhibit the same skills that we're trying to build in students, those five C's. We say that our students, when they leave our hallways, to help them be prepared for success in their futures, that they need to develop the ability to think critically, collaborate, communicate, to be creative, and to be citizens. And so one of the things that, that we have talked about, the board, as well as the administrative team, is how do we begin recognizing our staff members for, for exhibiting those types of behaviors in what they have students do or with their, in their work with one another. And so we have some folks with us tonight uh, who we are highlighting as it relates to the five C's and with a focus tonight on collaboration. And so I'm going to ask uh, if our uh, um, Monica Bruno to come up from the high school. <clears throat> Kelly, Hig Kelly Higgins, Chrissy DeRamo, and Bethany Kelly from the middle school. We have Tracy Rich, Liza Caprera uh, from, our, in, in, from our primary school. And I know that we have, uh, also from our primary school, we have Audra Mann and Megan Malucci. So, and they're here, they're gonna do another presentation, so, so they're staying, staying down there right now. If our principals would wanna come up as well that are here, I, I see Mrs. Ryber, Dr. St. Amant, uh, as, well as, as well as our, our middle school assistant principals. So if you wanna come up as well. Uh, Mrs. Gillen put together a publication that really highlights not only these folks, but the work that is happening with our students around collaboration, as well as our teachers collaborating with one another. Teaching can be a very lonely profession. You can choose to close your door, well, not really in Franklin Regional, but <laughs> most places you can choose to close your door and isolate yourself. But we know that through collaboration we can all grow and support one, one another's continued growth. And we, that when we work together and we support one another, we can accomplish tremendous things for students. So the folks before us this evening, we have so many people worthy to, to be standing, standing up here tonight. The folks before us this evening, 
strategically, effectively, intentionally, not only work with other people to help others grow, but also to support their own continuous growth. And that's what it means to be a professional, and that's what it means to be a professional in the Franklin Regional School District. So thank you for embodying what we hope for and expect from all of our staff. Thank you very much. Do our principals have anything to, to add to this in terms of uh, some of the work that's happening? No, I think you did it justice. I mean, obviously our focus was on collaboration. Oh, you gotta hit the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Otherwise. Uh, um, so our focus is on collaboration this time. And so at the primary school, I really wanted to highlight two educators that are doing such a phenomenal job with our new co-teaching initiative. One thing that we've really done is looked at our master schedule to find, to kind of maximize the support students are receiving in reading, knowing what an important thing that is. And so I brought with me a reading specialist and a first grade teacher that really exemplify the partnerships that are happening throughout the building in support of our kiddos. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the middle school, we obviously, at every school, we collaborate all the time, but these, uh, these three ladies work together all the time to um, collaborate together and also to encourage the kids to collaborate. And I did ask them to be prepared to discuss some things that they did with the kids. So if you have a second, they are pre they're prepared to share with you some really amazing things <laughs> that they do with the kids because they're better at this than I am. Absolutely. I, we're happy to have them talk. I, Heath, do you want to say something about Mrs. Bruno first? Yeah. What I, one thing I'd like to say about Monica, you know, if you go into her classroom, you, you'll, you would, you'd see it tomorrow if you walked in. Um, it's just a part of the culture, that collaboration. And, you know, students really have to be problem solvers with one another in that classroom. And Monica works with students of all different abilities, all needs, and, and really lives that. Lives that. Um, the other thing I appreciate about Monica, too, though, is that you know, you see that from a professional standpoint and see it outside of the classroom. And she has personally helped us work on some systems and things like that school with the school this year, too, that has, have been a, really a big help. So, no, My friends from the middle school. Who's going to start here? Um, we did. Somewhere. <laughs> oh, we got it. So in working with our curriculum uh, a couple years ago, we were looking through different passages to read and things like that for the students that, were, that would draw into interest. And one of the things we talked about was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire of 1911. And we knew it was a tragedy. We knew the story behind it to some extent. But to bring that to life for the students, we wanted to have an investigative piece with it. And you can switch over. Um, so we started reading, the, um, before starting reading the passage, I showed the middle picture and we looked at it at a closer lens of what do we see, what do we think, what do we know, going from that. So that piece really drew the interest of we see water, we see people, we see smoke, we see windows blown out. So something tragic happened with the building to some extent, and they were looking at different pieces of, it looks like it was a city. So just putting those pieces together, and then the two right pictures were the, uh, the aftermath of it. And showing them different pictures like that, what happened, why do you think it happened, what do you see in the aftermath that could have been prevented? And after reading the passage, the students, and you can go on to the next one, um, did a little bit of t conversation about text structure, problem solution, sequencing, things like that. And we came up with a project in which they were brainstorming ideas to prevent things like this for the future. Knowing it was 1911, but kind of have putting the today's spin on it. So the way we divvied up jobs is we had a project manager, lead engineer, assistant engineer, and two tech people. And that collaboration piece of having all these people working together really brought to light what the students were doing. And they worked through materials, brainstorming, and sketch the first day, and then work from that point. If you, thank you. And here's a few pictures of the outcome of it with all the five Cs. 
but collaboration was seen throughout the entire project from beginning to end with the communication piece of brainstorming ideas, working with the tech department. Uh, Mrs. Bell Giovanni is in one of those pictures. Um, the citizenship picture with collaboration of the tech department, working with the project manager. So it really brought to light a lot of different ideas for the students and showed that creativity piece as well. And the students worked on this for a week. We had the, all the ELA teachers worked on in different aspects throughout a three week period. But it was something that they really enjoyed. It was hands on for them. But that collaboration piece and seeing students shining in different areas that we wouldn't see them in the classroom was, was a huge piece of it. So to bring it back to English, because we are English teachers, um, the final writing component that we did was an advertisement that showcased all of the different changes that they made in the building and tried to get people of this time period to apply for jobs at the new and improved Triangle Shirtwaist Factory um, without the fire part of it. So they had to write up a little bit of persuasive writing and encourage people to want to apply with wages, talking about the new safety features. Um, we used Canva to do these so they could pull in different graphics and things like that. So this year we did have to make some changes due to unforeseen um, circumstances. So we are actually going to apply this project in a new manner. I'm new to Franklin Regional this year, so I was very fortunate <coughs> to work with Ms. Higgins, Ms. <coughs> and Mrs. Belgiovanni. And so we're really analyzing now the giver and how we can apply such a multifaceted process. how it can create a society that appeals to everyone. And then we're looking at what protocols and rules should be considered for members of the community. And then it all ties into that last piece of how do students create a model society that integrates safety, individuality, and comfort using technology. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. Next up is Dr. Ryan Smith, Audra Meehan, Megan Malucci, and Megan Belzik to talk about MTSS and the work that's happening. Oh, I'm not neat. Good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to present on our, uh, where we are currently with our MTSS framework. But before I get into that, I just want to congratulate all the uh, staff and students that were recognized tonight. What a, what a great honor for everyone. So, um, and I think we can hopefully follow up on this with these three uh, amazing uh, ladies that I get to work with on a weekly basis. So um, MTSS, last year we started uh, the process to develop a framework where we were looking at the academic piece of the MTSS. Down in the primary K-2, to two, we were mainly working in the ELA reading and writing. Uh, and then in the three to five, the focus seemed to be uh, more on mathematics. About halfway through the year, uh, Mrs. Belsick joined us. Uh, and her focus was kind of a 50-50, but probably a little more emphasis uh, technically on, on the math world based off of just starting things in the January, February months of, of the year. So uh, MTSS, as you know, is a multi But you're looking at probably around 15 to 20% of students that need a little more support uh, in and possibly out of the classroom. And then your tier three, is your uh, intensive um, uh, or intensive support for students? You're typically talking about three to five percent of the students. Just trying to um, give you a little highlights of what MTSS is. One of the out, we roll this framework out, and then we're constantly reflecting. And as we reflect on our practices, we evolve to make sure we are meeting the needs. Uh, for all students, so we're able to support them throughout the year, um, math, ELA, and everything else that kind of goes with a child through the educational process. 
Um, we've had quite the evolution of the framework. As I, as I stated, we just started last year, I want to say uh, at the beginning of the year, in, in uh, August, September. And the strides that we've made and the changes that we've made over the last uh, probably 14, 15 months have been absolutely amazing. And I can't wait to see what this framework and program continues to look like as we support all students here in the Franklin Regional School District. Um, it says the consistency across the district, it is a long process. They, they typically say to uh, get an MTSS um, framework up and running, it's about three to five year process. I wanna say the work that these three have done over the last, um, like I said, 12, 13 months have absolutely accelerated that process. And I cannot leave out the work that Mr. Kern up at the high school is doing with that staff. Um, he, he's absolutely done an amazing job and I think some of his spreadsheets, as we like to refer to, uh, are absolutely amazing, Se second to none, and we're gonna start stealing from him a little bit. Um, as you can see, we have lots of partnerships. Uh, when we brought in Spring Math this, this year, we partnered with <laughs> the uh, Patton, uh, the, uh, and then Butler Area um, School District. We worked with Math Stackers, IU, Patton, uh, and not just the WIU, but also the AIU. And as the, I'll close it out because I don't want to steal too much of their thunder. But the MTSS is all about data collection and analysis. Once you receive that data about the children across the grade, then you start to develop a plan, uh, you know, to support them uh, moving forward. And that is, that's what the three of these do on a daily basis. Throughout, throughout the week we meet, um, we continue to, to collaborate and work together. I, I could not pick a better group to work with on a, on a weekly basis. They've done an amazing job for every student across this district. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight that I believe that our MTSS framework has really strengthened is our PLC process across the building K-12. to We're able to utilize the data that, you know, from the students and the three of them along with uh, Mr. Curran up at the high school they guide the process during the PLC. They look at data. They look at best instructional practices to support the students. They're looking at ways to remediate and enrich uh, students depending on the needs and um, you know, challenges and strengths that exist, not only student by student, but really across the board. And last but not least, I know Dr. Perano talked about the five Cs. Oh, too much, Matt. Too much, Dr. Delp, sorry. Um, so these are the five C's that, the, this is how we see our MTSS process uh, going throughout the, um, the R5 C's across the district. I'm not gonna read word for word there, but uh, hopefully you get a chance to, to, to look at that and kind of wrap your head around it. Uh, without further ado though, I'd love to uh, first start out at the primary, K-2, to uh, Mrs. Meehan, please. Can I ask one question? Y you mentioned that it was 15 to 20 percent for tier two. Yeah, g give or take. Three to five percent for tier three, mm -hmm. which would equate to, if we have roughly 3,300 kids, 660 kids are involved in this program that we're going to hear about. Absolutely. And then tier three would be about 160 kids. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the goal between those tiers is to support those students, and you're going to see some ins and outs of this, you know, the students. Some may be with you for six to eight weeks, longer, shorter, depending on how they respond to the particular interventions. Right. I, I just wanted to make sure we have, the, like, those solid numbers. Those percentages are great. Yeah. But to understand the magnitude of the work that you all do, I wanted to have those solid numbers. For, That's great. Um, Thank you so much for... For calculating that. <laughs> I'll lead into that then. <laughs> Mr. Lyman, did you get a preview of my splash page, baby, with all those numbers? Um, I'm Audra Meehan. I'm at the primary building. Um, and so if you look at our little pie chart over there for ELA instruction, sorry, I like move. I was joking that I was going to walk with this microphone. Um, but if you look at that, that's our ELA instruction. So what Principal Ryber had talked about was how we have started a foundational ELA block, and that includes co-teaching, and that is when support teachers can come in and essentially students get that tier one instruction, which is the core instruction, but additionally they get that tier two support. So you have students, we call it double dosing. So students who might need remediation or 
reteaching of a specific area, they receive that. So that's what's being hit at the first and second grade level right now. And then in kindergarten, we're slowly moving into this uh, ELA foundational block framework as well, because in kindergarten, we spend a good chunk of the beginning of the school year getting them used to routines and structure and really focusing on the letters and sounds. But we still hit on the tier instruction as well. So in kindergarten, tier one is the whole group. Tier two, there's some push and support going on during tier two. We have instructional aides, we have reading support teachers, and then at tier three is a little bit more pull out support. Um, and then again, so this is some more primary specific information. What we're also doing in MTSS is also the positive behavior initiative. So if any of you have students at the primary building, you might be familiar with the pledge. Um, I know my kids say it before bed every night, so, and then we say it every morning as well. But then we also are creating common assessments. So one thing that Dr. Smith talked a lot about was as we develop um, an MTSS framework, it's really important to grow our professional learning communities, and that's what PLC stands for. So we meet with, as grade level teams, and it's not just kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. It's also reading support teachers, gifted teachers, special educators, speech teachers. So it's everybody who has a stakeholder with these kids, and it's developing them and making decisions based on data. And that's a huge part of the communication and collaboration that we do. Additionally, what we do as a team is we are providing students with consistent and explicit instruction. So students might be with their classroom teacher during tier one or core instruction, but it doesn't mean they're getting different instruction when they might be in a tier two or tier three environment. The instruction is based on our curriculum that we've developed as teachers, and we continue to reinforce it with explicit instruction. And then as far as development, we are very fortunate to have lots of professional development opportunities here at Franklin. Um, all primary teachers are part of the letters training. This is our second year, and it's all based on the science of reading research. So um, every teacher will, in the primary building, K-2, to will come away with that certification. And on top of that, our reading specialists and special ed teachers are um, tra all trained in Sunday. And at the primary building, we all received ECRI training, which is an overlay for our um, ELA curriculum. And on top of all of that, we have the honor of attending the Primary Teacher Academy. There's certain teachers who go each year. So again, we're getting lots of opportunities for development. And I think I have one more slide. Okay, and then this is my um, data slide. So this is the beginning of the year. One of our big driving forces with the ELA foundational block is looking at our students and developing them as readers. So this is really drill drilling down to the basics of reading. And so that is through our Acadians benchmark. And this is second grade nonsense word fluency and first grade nonsense word fluency. And if you take a look, so there's um, the population at the bottom of students. And then the WWR stands for whole words read. And the CLS stands for um, uh, correct letter sounds. So what this is, is this projects for how students read Sometimes you might have heard of them as called pseudo words or nonsense words, and it assesses how student letter and sound correspondence is, and then it projects how they will do as a reader. So in our ELA foundational block, this is really what we're drilling down to is the basics of skills, because the more automatic students become at decoding and mastering the code of decoding and phonics, the better they'll be as a reader, and then it leaves room in their cognitive capacity for fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. So this is our, we like to call our bread and butter of the primary building. Just to jump in on that real quick, from a nonsense word fluency and being a parent of former elementary principal and also parent of, of elementary age children at one point, when we were teaching this, and I remember my kids saying, these words don't even make any sense. And, pre-reading words or during, the, um, during a whole language process, kids, a lot of times they would have kids memorize words. And so we called those kids word callers. So they didn't really know how to decode. When we know about the science of reading, <clears throat> excuse me, students have to be able to decode. K to two, K to three, kids are learning to read. They're learning, uh, all, all the syllables and how, the, how those letters work together in terms of sound and so forth. When we get into third grade, into fourth grade and beyond, we're reading to learn. And then we get into multisyllabic words. And the students who were great word callers 
in K to 2, when they, if they haven't mastered those, the syllabication or, or, or the phonics piece of this, when they get into the upper grades and they have to sound out multisyllabic words that are longer, that you just can't recall, and it's just not automatic, when they don't have those skills, it creates gaps and it slows down their fluency, which impacts their comprehension because they have to read at a certain rate to be able to comprehend the material. So when all that slows down and they can't get into the multisyllabic words or can't decode the multisyllabic words, you see a drop in performance, significantly usually in about fifth grade. And then in eighth grade, when they don't have those skills, it becomes a cliff because it gets even more difficult in terms of the content. And so the nonsense word fluency, though kids are, will be like, this is so, so senseless because these words don't mean anything and I don't understand why I'm doing this. The reason they do the nonsense words is so that way we can take a look and see are they gaining those skills around decoding or are they just word calling? They just recognize the word and they call it out. And so there's a lot of conversation about the science of reading right now. And I'm definitely, if you ask me where I sit, I'm a science of reading person. Uh, hence why we do a lot of the work, work we do, because we as a group believe in the research behind how kids learn how to read. And so, so I know there might be some people at home saying, why are they reading nonsense words? That's really why. So, uh, but I thank you for, for your explanation of it, because it, it makes all the sense, all the sense of the world. Good evening. Hello. I'm Megan Malucci. This is my 34th year of teaching at Franklin Regional, wow. and I'm a proud FR grad. <laughs> this job is probably the best job I've ever had. Taught fourth grade for 32 years, and then you've heard me speak about the Westmoreland Online Academy, and now this position. The MTSS position is so important. And I think the most powerful thing about it is we're seeing change and we're seeing growth with these kids. That's everything. Even a little bit of growth, even a little bit of change is positive and is to be celebrated. We have instructional gaps that exist. And our role is to try to figure out what those gaps are, meet those kids where they are, support them, and then help them to improve. For me, that's everything. And I've been working with some really incredible people through this process. I've learned so much. And I think that's what's so important, too, is to never stop learning. It's easy to just kind of sit back and say, oh, I've got this. I'm good. No, you just keep learning, researching, and working with the best in the business. That makes all the difference in the world. For my splash page, these are the things you already know. We have the universal screeners in place. These are the ways that we determine where our kids have gaps or needs. Perhaps they need enrichment. Perhaps they need to have extra support. The universal screener that we use at the intermediate is STAR. That's our primary. And patent endorsed. So we're only using the best. In addition to that, we also are using things like spring math. Again, patent endorsed. Anything that we use at the intermediate is vetted. We make sure it's research-based and it's a powerful tool. STAR is the best universal screener out there. It allows us to dig down deeply into those foundational planks to determine where the needs are, whether that be decoding, if we're doing reading, or the basic four operations in math. I do both, reading and math for intermediate. That's everything for us, because as long as we can see that there's a gap there, if there's a gap in decoding, I guarantee there's a gap everywhere else in reading. If there's a gap in operations, I guarantee there'll be a gap everywhere else in application of those skills. We have to fill those gaps, otherwise our kids can't grow. So that's what I tried to do. Once I have those scores, then the planning and support can begin. By drilling down and seeing where the needs are, I can then create the best lessons for the students that have these needs. 
And again, I want it to be lively. I want it to be fun. I want it to be a time where they come to me and they are excited to learn. And they are. My door is open anytime if you want to come in and see what this looks like. It's incredible. The kids are excited to be there and they perform well because we try to use innovative practices that again are research-based. One example, and this all kind of ties into that communication piece, uh, we wrote a grant uh, for math stackers, which you might not have ever heard of before, but I did bring a little sample of what they look like. They're magnetic. Um, they're, they also have foam version for primary. It's all based on a series of 10. Kelly Threadgill is the creator, and I have partnered with her. Um, she will talk with me, meet with me, support what we're doing. I have done professional development for all of the teachers um, at the intermediate. Um, primary was invited to come. Middle school was invited to come to uh, show the teachers how to implement math stackers for our tier two kids. For tier three, I use them pretty consistently. Everything's based on a series of 10. So if you have the ones all stacked up, they'll equal a 10. But it's also looking at things in terms of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and fraction work can all be done with these math stackers. This little tool is so powerful. And for kids that don't do well with the drill, they don't do well with uh, trying to solve things through a traditional algorithm, this is a game changer because it's a more creative way, a visual way, a tactile way, a spatial way to learn. And that's what we try to do. We have to find another way for them to learn. So this has been revolutionary. And so the teachers have these in their hands and during our professional development just this past week, uh, they all had time during that seven hour day to go through every session of the math stackers so that they would be ready to help their tier two students in the classroom. Tier two happens in the classroom. I provide those materials for them, but the teachers disseminate that. It's no more than five kids in the room. And I do the tier three. Um, and those are the kids that have the most needs. Um, so for the next slide, Dr. Delp, thank you. Um, partnering with the best in the business has been my goal from the very beginning. I had to learn from the best that were out there that were doing this on a regular basis. So Dia Jackson, um, she is a senior researcher in MTSS in Washington, DC. She and I talk, collaborate, and she has helped to support everything that I am doing. Her rule is it, you must have six points of data in order to make any kind of change. And it has to be consistent because you have to have sustainability. So I am drilling down every week. My students have progress monitoring every single week when they're tier three students. That means after they get intensive interventions, they then take a test. And that test gives me new data to show me, are they gaining in those areas that are weak? If we can show growth over a four week period of time that's consistent and consecutive, then they have move back to the tier two situation. So it's an ebb and a flow, like Dr. Smith was saying. Sometimes kids will stay with me for months. Sometimes kids will be with me for six weeks and then we'll be exited. But that data is analyzed every single week for my tier three kids and for tier two kids, uh, Dia Jackson says every other week for them. So they're getting the tier two with their teacher and then they will take a progress monitoring test every other week and that test is through STAR. So again, we just stay consistent with that universal screener. Um, Matt Burns uh, is my partner in uh, reading. So partner reading is his thing and students working together um, to read passages and then paragraph shrink. Tell us what you've read in 10 words or less. That's a tier two intervention as well. But I also use ReadWorks, which is Matt Burns. Um, and in ReadWorks, my tier three students decode words, uh, multisyllabic words. Um, Dr. Raffone's been so supportive in what do you need? What tools do you need? Um, we're using um, syllaboards. They're small boards that you break down words into their syllables and then, well, I'm old enough to remember the, the show Zoom back in the day or the electric company where you'd push the words together, all the parts together to create one word. The students love it and they're motivated by it. And they're motivated by things like math stackers too. So they come excited and, and what we're doing is vetted and research-based and so we can really trust in what we're doing. Um, 
Communication is the centerpiece of everything that I do. My teachers receive every single week a summary report that has what our focus was, what the interventions were, and what they can do to follow up on their own with those students when I am not with them. Summary reports happen every week. Um, also, after six weeks, more intensive reports are uh, disseminated that are about each of the tier three students um, and, and how they've grown, or if they haven't grown, why haven't they grown? And looking at the whole child, which is a new piece of this. We are adding the whole child piece into this. If a child isn't growing, why? What's going on? Is something happening that we need to be aware of? What other ways can we support this child beyond academics? Um, so working alongside uh, these amazing people, Kelly Threadgill, like I said before, with the math stackers, we have the partnership with St. Vincent College. I have a teaching fellow this year, completely certified teacher, but works alongside me to provide enrichment opportunities for students and also some tier three support as well. Um, so those are the biggest pieces of what's going on at the intermediate. Um, but I feel like the proudest piece that I have is this next slide, Dr. Delp, which talks about the fact that it's Equity, 50% of my time is spent with reading interventions, Mondays and Wednesdays. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's math intervention, so it's half and half. And these are for my tier three students. But what I'm most proud about is this. From the beginning of the year benchmark, 82% of our tier three reading students and 89% of our tier three math students have shown growth in the foundational planks. And that was obtained by doing our analysis over the course of the six weeks of intensive interventions. So the fact that we have growth is everything. And when a student exits a tier three situation with me and they move into tier two, I just wanna be honest with you, they oftentimes are a little disappointed that they're leaving. Okay, well, that happened last week, Thursday. A kid came down and said, that means I can't come anymore? I said, my door is always open, you can always come. But we want them to earn that right to go back in and, and be amongst their peers. But the work that I'm doing, the intensive interventions, I'm seeing such growth and change. And I'm so proud of these kids for what they've done. And I'm so proud of the staff at the Intermediate who have embraced this program and have worked alongside me. And when the schedule gets tweaked a little bit because we've got to move kids in or out, they're there and they do exactly as I ask. And it's a six-page schedule. But they're on it and they're with me. And Dr. Buffon has been incredible, and Dr. Smith has been so wonderful, and I'm so proud to work with this team. And now Megan Belsick. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Belsick from the middle school. Um, even though the middle school got a later start with MTSF implementation, um, we really hit the ground running this school year. And with the leadership of our building principals, um, the biggest change that I have seen so far is the mindset shift in our collaboration. We're lucky enough that our PLCs meet twice a week, our content area PLCs, as well as our house PLCs. Um, <coughs> and that collaboration time is now spent focused, and it's effective, and it's efficient. We're more efficient than ever before. Because we have all of this data that we're looking at, we have the universal screener star like Megan was um, explaining. But we also are in our second year of PBIS implementation. So um, what that means is we have academic data from our screeners and our common assessments, but we also have our behavioral data. And we're looking at all of this together um, and really looking at the whole child and touching on that academic piece as well as that behavioral piece, which of course is important at any age, but in a middle school, it is everything, I think. Um, and we are, our, our PLC meetings are just focused. Um, we are, our, our principals had us create um, PLC norms and we have stuck with them. And the, that combined with the house system and um, our meeting times throughout the week, we have been able to collaborate and look at the data and create the support intervention that's needed, but also have the time for that follow-up that all of this requires to, you know, to maintain. Um, our specific support intervention all night about Math Lab. So um, it has been probably one of the best additions to our school 
for our you know, tier two, tier three students that honestly their biggest issue with math is, is truly a confidence-based issue. They don't have the confidence to discuss math and talk about math and what they're learning. You know, they just wanna get the, the answer and be done and, and be over with it, but they have no idea why they did it and, and you know, what, what it means and, and wh why we're doing what we're doing. So the math lab has been huge for so many of our students. So again, I, I could talk all night about that one. But um, so we also have daily tier three support um, during our intervention, intervention and enrichment period, which is at the end of the day. So that allows me to meet with an even smaller group of students to provide more um, intense interventions in a one-on-one, in a -on -one, even, you know, PLC meetings um, have provided such a, an effective way to discuss and look at all of the data. So we're looking at, again, the whole child and having conversations um, within our meetings that you know, we've never had before. And it's, it, it's, a, it's exciting to experience this mindset shift and truly a change of culture. Um, it's become more of a shared ownership than ever before. And um, you know, it, it's our kids more so than you know, these are my math kids, these are your math kids. It's, it's our kids and um, it's, it's, it's been great. It, it really has. Um, me personally at the middle school, so I get to, again, co-teach during all three math labs. And within those math labs, we are progress monitoring, um, like Megan had explained, through the STAR program. Um, and we're also having the student goal setting meetings, which is awesome. It's a one-on-one -on -one where we're really looking at their progress together and, um, and creating goals. I already touched on the math and grade level PLC meetings, but that again is where I've seen the biggest change so far this school year. Um, and it, it truly is benefiting the students more so than ever before. Within those meetings, we get to analyze our STAR data, our common assessment data, and the behavioral data, like I mentioned, in order to determine the, um, our tier three groups. And um, we're implementing that support within the classroom and during ninth period. Um, we are all, the math department in the middle school and the high school is also attending um, uh, math professional development with Ann Bergender, who's been amazing to work with. It's a monthly professional development and she is implementing, um, or providing us with the tools to implement um, something called a to, it's a way that we've never discussed math before. Um, and some of the kids, we've, we've done a few like trial trial lessons so far and the kids are like what what's happening what are we, what are we doing um but they are before they know it they are discussing math which again is something that can be a bit uncomfortable for them especially when they are not um you know that's not their favorite thing to do but it's getting them to do it without you know making it uncomfortable and then um participating in sap it's our second year of PBIS implementation, which has been amazing, and we have a wellness committee. So honestly, all of those together, it's building our MTSS framework for our building that focuses on the whole child. And then finally, um, nearly three-fifths of our tier three math students have shown growth since the beginning of the year. And again, I know Megan had already explained this, but progress monitoring. Um, this is actually our first year utilizing star progress monitoring. So it's been, it's, it's been honestly very fun to implement and to see growth and to have the students see growth and, and recognize that within themselves. Um, it's a little bit different within the middle school because they understand more so what we're doing. You know, in, in the elementary level, um, it's, you know, it's fun, it's PBIS, it's, you know, it's positive, and they have their, you know, their adorable chant, which I, which I just love, it's so cute. But if we were to do that in the middle school, that probably wouldn't fly. So they sort of see right through it, but in a good way. They, you know, we've, I've told them before that, you know, you're our partners, it's your education, and as much as the shared ownership is within the, within the staff, it's also within the students. And it's just been very exciting to see that mindset shift with Dr. St. Amont, St. Amont and Ms. Berg. Um, it, it, it truly is a change of culture. So it's exciting. Thank you.
Well, as you can see, there's a, a lot of passion um, amongst the three of them. Uh, they truly do amazing work. Um, next time we come uh, to present, probably in the early winter, we'll have some other additional data points so we can really start to see the progress that the children have made over from the fall test to the winter test. So we're pretty excited about uh, seeing that play out. Um, but I also want to state, you, you kind of heard through all three of them, the students are are gaining huge benefits from their work, but the collaboration amongst the three of them with the entire staff is second to none. I mean, everyone, I think uh, Smolucci used the word, like everyone's buying into this. This was, you know, something I said earlier, three to five year process. We have pretty much 100% staff buy-in within 14 months. That's, that's amazing and kudos to the three of them. They're doing great work. So. Thank you so much. Do you guys have any questions for myself or, or the team? I just wanted to say, it sounds like it, when I went to school 40 years ago, we just all lined up in desks and all got pretty much taught the same way. Um, sounds like this is more of a tailored approach, identifying the, the kids that truly need um, additional supports. And I, I love the different learning styles because some kids are more visual. I'm a more visual person. Some kids like to read it on their own. But truly understanding how that child learns best um, is really important to me um, and trying to customize that education. And I, I really thank you for all, all the work you're doing. Thank, thank you guys very much for your passion that you put in. It's a, you're basically a grassroots organization that is really collaborating and getting these kids to pretty much come out of a shell. And when you can see the growth that you guys have done already in such a short period of time, that's phenomenal. So thank you for the entire community for what you're doing for the kids. They are truly building confidence with all students. It's, it's amazing to see. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes the superintendent's report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Perino. Um, we're going to go to uh, public comments. We have one, uh, Helen Elliott. You can state your name and address, and then uh, you'll have four minutes. Helen Elliott, 3166 Chestnut Street, Murraysville, 15668. And in the spirit of all of this congratulating and that we're doing here, I would like to say that uh, I participated or observed uh, two wonderful music concerts this past week. Although there were three, one uh, I was told was very, another one was very, very good. And so I would really like to commend the music program for all the work that they are doing, the staff is doing um, with, with our music program. And the other congratulations are to the candidates who won the last election. So to each of you who won, I congratulate you. Thank you. That concludes public comments. Uh, next, any solicitor comments? I have nothing for public session, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to consent agenda items number one, uh, Mrs. Cal, for bus and van drivers for 2023-2024. Good evening. I have two agenda items on the list for you. Um, both of these items we try and bring to you four times a year. So for the second time, we are bringing the most updated list of our full-time bus drivers and spare bus drivers. And then we also have a list under the administrative section uh, is the current list of all of our bus stops. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. Next, uh, gifts, grants, and donations, Mr. Perry, and, and then other items. Good evening. Uh, this month, uh, we received a $3,000 grant from the Grable Foundation for uh, what they call Little Bets, um, basically district initiatives to provide some seed capital. 
And then also two grants from PPG Industries, a $2,000 grant to the primary school and $1,999.45 to the middle school. Uh, next, we have appointments and contracts. Uh, tonight, we're uh, recommending approval of the school dentist to be De Maria Family Orthodontics. Uh, Dr. Abraham served as a school dentist for a number of years, and he has retired, so Dr. De Maria was willing to take it on and uh, was willing to maintain the same $7 per exam rate for mandatory school dental exams. Any questions? Next, we have the annual approval of the district's investment and depository accounts, as well as the authorized signers. Questions? Right. Homestead and yes. Homestead. Up next, uh, again, this is an annual item um, required mailing to any properties that don't currently have the homestead farmstead exemption. Uh, all or m the majority of the school districts in the county, I believe, engage uh, Westmoreland County to handle that mailing on our behalf. So it's seventy-six cents per mailing, which is the same cost as the prior year, and there are approximately twenty-seven hundred properties that that mailing will go out to. This is, this is to people who are eligible, but they would have a, a an eligible property, but don't have the homestead farm exempt. Homestead Correct. Property. Okay. Thank you. You said it's twenty seven hundred. Correct. Roughly. Thank you. Next monthly budget transfers, uh, general fund totaling seven thousand seven hundred dollars and eighty nine cents. <clears throat> And then finally, um, just due to the dates of meetings, um, as customary, looking for a pre-approval for the December list of bills. Uh, we will send that list of bills to the full board on the 14th of December, and those payments wouldn't be mailed until the 19th, giving you an opportunity to review the list and uh, ask any questions. Any questions for Mr. Perry? Thank you. Thank you. All right, next uh, we will go to policy review, second read and adoption. Dr. Delt. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the first item to bring forward this evening is a second read and proposed adoption of policies 217 graduation, policy 800 records management, and policy 800.1 electronic signatures and records. Any questions? You'd like me to repeat? No. Television. All right. Next, the uh, policy uh, retirement of policies, Dr. Dole. Yes. The next item is as a result of uh, the proposed adoption of policy. 800 and 800.1, uh, just previously stated, we would be able to propose the retirement of uh, the what are currently active policies 800.1. Uh, electronic data storage and 800.2 electronic signatures and records uh, due to the redundancy that we found in the policies and the consolidation of policies that occurred through the PSBA. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Dr. Delt. Uh, weapons detection system, Mr. Skoog. Good evening. This is a re request to uh, purchase the open gate weapons detection system for the high school and the middle school. We uh, looked at different products over a couple last couple years, and uh, price and reliability, warranty, and ease of using this open gate system is seems to be the best. Our uh, external safety committee reviewed the product. We did a presentation during the meeting uh, in October, and uh, it's, a, it's a great product we'd like to implement at the high school and the middle school. Total cost? $140,989.40 for both schools. For both schools, how many units total? It's uh, eight units altogether. <laughs> Did it take two units per door or one? Two units per door based on how many uh, population we have at each school. Okay. 
And then the systems are portable enough that we can move them to the football field if we need to or in, or in front of the gymnasium if we want to. We want to scan uh, visitors. But you basically can scan four doors, two in each building during the... And we have a t uh, roughly 1,200 students at the high school and roughly 600 come in the back door getting off buses, so that would divide it so they can smoothly come in the, in the door without even taking their backpacks off. Wow. Mr. Skoog and I had, took the opportunity to go watch this, uh, the entrance in the school district with about eight to 900 students that can't go to that school. They were able to get about 800 kids through, the, through two, two units in about six to seven minutes. Right now we do bag checks, those bag checks take longer than, than, than what, what these devices take, so. The same system is used by the Secret Service and a lot of federal agencies and that's, we are able to get on a purchase with a federal agency to, to get a cheaper price. I'd like to make a comment that I was actually privileged to be in the meeting and saw firsthand the operation of the, uh, the, the devices. Uh, they don't have any kind of a fear factor. In fact, most people, if you go to an airport and you walk through, that's what the TSA is using currently right now. They are portable. And um, in my personal opinion, uh, I would rather be never sitting and second guessing and saying, boy, I wish I would have. I would highly recommend that our school district implement something like this and be safe versus sorry. Um, Dr. Remy. Yes. Uh, is there any update on the grant situation for uh, to not pay for, for part of this? Not for this product. No. You currently, uh, so actually, we had a discussion today. The, the legislature approved an increase in expenditure uh, for education. And, however, after that was approved, the omnibus bill, which is, tells them how to spend that money has not been approved. So all the safety and security money and various components are, are stuck in Harrisburg and, and not flowing out. So that's, so that's the challenge. But there will be a possibility that we, we will go for a retroactive grant. Is, are, we, are we going to try to, there, there's no possibility of? Not right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. No. I think one of the one of the things that impressed me just reading about the program, I wasn't unfortunately I was unable to attend that meeting was the portability of it. You know, which in today's world, I think is a portable thing. In fact, you may come. I won't be here, but you may come to where it's on these two doors right here. Is sometime in the future. I mean, the way the world is out there. Yes, sir. Yeah, the other part is just the sheer process of moving the students in and out quicker. <clears throat> you know, we're hearing a lot of complaints with the backup of traffic. This is going to just really quickly accelerate that much quicker. With the less, with the less manpower. With less manpower, less bodies, less cost, Absolutely. and moving the kids through safely, safely quickly. One of the things I do like, though, mm -hmm. uh, when it, students are processing through, they have to remove backpacks from, or I'm sorry. After you it, Are the relationships that I see between adults and kids, that engagement, that positive engagement, because they actually still have to take uh, bind, like large binders and laptops out of, out of their backpack, and they hand it to a, a human being. And when we were at Forest Hills, the, there was still that human interaction, that connection between adult and student that I really think is important. And I can't underemphasize the importance of relationships and the ability to engage with students. And a lot of times coming in the door, our staff can know what type of day they're having before they come through those doors. And that is one of the things I was actually really concerned about. But after watching that, that conversation about 
the student activity the, the day before, whether it's a concert or a game or, or what have you. That, re that relationship is, is just as important as these types of devices as we look to, to support our students. Their, their staff there actually mentioned that they gave them more time to pull a student aside and have a conversation. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next couple items, um, we'll start with Mind Up, Ms. DeFolvio. This request is for approval for a 30 day review of the Mind Up program. This program is a K to 8 um, evidence based program that would be um, a continuation of our work through the Grable Foundation and Parents as Allies. Foundation. Um, they are also funding multiple other districts in the area um, using this program. Um, the focus would be initially for the 24-25 school year to have a team in each of the three buildings, so the primary, intermediate, and middle school um, that consist of a teacher, a counselor, potentially one of our PIT MAPS um, liaisons, and a parent who would become trained in this program. The program would then be rolled out to all teachers and parents in the community who were interested, and it focuses on um, teaching children and adults how their brains work and how um, emotional regulation and executive functioning occurs in the brain. And they are very simple lessons that are then provided that in a developmentally appropriate um, age range, and they are focused on creating opportunities to show gratitude, kindness, and service to the community. So it would be a continuation of our work around um, family engagement and would ultimately result in um, an understanding across our staff, students, and families um, in terms of how our brains function and how we can better improve our community relationships um, through this work. So there are lessons um, available, and they would go on 30-day review. And we would, again, not begin the training until the 24-25 school year with the rollout planned for 25-26. Is uh, Mr. Defolio, is this the basic version of this program or the pro version? Do you know? Um, not sure which part you're referring to. Are you looking at in these documents? Well, when I, I, I read some information about this and they talked about there was two different levels of program, one and, and two different cost levels too. Right, so um, I think what they're talking about are the, the training packages, at least from my understanding, um, the training could be, you could just roll it out to teachers and that would be kind of your basic level. We don't believe in that model because that puts a lot of emphasis on teachers only providing this information. Um, the model that we would be, um, and again, Grable would pay for the entire um, cost of the program. It would train administrators, staff, parents, and then um, teams of counselors, parents, and, and staff who would then bring that into the classrooms. And so, and, it, and this, this, and the, the teachers are learning this for their own edification or to teach the students? So the lessons come, they're very quick little video lessons and they come um, prepared for the teachers. The teachers would learn about their own executive functioning and emotional regulation through the, the neuroscience that's taught to them about brain development. And then they would learn about the age range that they teach. So the students in their classrooms, what um, what that brain development looks like for them. And then as they provide these lessons, they would be able to discuss with the students and create those opportunities for, um, it, it also ties into the PBIS because it would create opportunities for um, creating gratitude lessons, um, service-oriented projects within the buildings and then within the community. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? Yeah, um, I have one about the, um, you know, I was reading through some of the materials and looking at the videos and I had a lot of concerns about the, the meditation part of it and um, some of the stuff that's going to be used, the, the tools that they want to use are more, again, mental health 
kind of tools versus um, the teaching what we should be teaching our kids. And yes, I understand the mental piece of it is important, but I don't know that the public and parents understand that this involves your child sitting there in meditation mode. And that to me is Buddhism. So I think that we need to get that out there that this is not, if we're not gonna teach religion in our schools, this is definitely a religious ritual. So I, I have a lot of concerns about the program itself. Any additional comments or questions? <clears throat> there is nothing in the literature that um, is relative to religion, um, as far as I have seen. And um, the research has occurred for this evidence-based program over the past 20 years. And it is um, very clear that calming your mind assists with functioning well as you learn. So some of our students who, um, you may see external reasons why they might um, be agitated or need to calm themselves. You also have students who are internally anxious, um, who these, these quick videos will help breathing techniques that um, can help them calm down. And that, that does help you learn. Um, so the more your mind is open and capable of receiving information and critical thinking, um, a lot of the research that's provided in these documents does note that. Um, this, also, this work has also shown to help with reducing teacher burnout because um, there are ways then for students and teachers to all come together and find ways to create a culture in their classroom that is conducive to learning. Um, I can certainly look into this further and bring the representatives forward to you if you have specific questions, and we will absolutely be willing to um, go in depth into any area that, that anyone has concerns about before moving forward. That's part of the 30-day review. Um, so the representatives working with us within Western Pennsylvania and the other school districts are all willing to um, come in and talk to anyone who has questions. Yes, Mr. Brown. Um, I researched it for, because of the same question, and there are some there are some statements made in there specifically that it it is not religion whatsoever. It uses some techniques that come from ancient religions, but not not the religions themselves. The techniques. The other thing that I found interesting was that the American United States comments about this program are very 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 positive. Um, and the British comments about this program are absolutely uh, diametrically opposed and negative and to the point where they say it's, it's a waste of time and taxpayers' money. So it's like everything else here, you know, sometimes beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but I'm, I'm convinced enough because we had this discussion, I'm convinced enough that there is not a religious aspect to it. There may, there may be some questions about how, you know, that's why I asked the question is, it's all great for the superintendent, for the for the for the superintendent's mind be mindful, and for you to be mindful. But the bottom game here is for the kids to be mindful and learn that. And I want to be sure that that's the trickle down effect of everybody else learning this. Thank you. Can I think, Mr. President? Can I say something? <coughs> yes, please. Um, we when we discussed this in the um, committee meeting, the the focus of the project, the focus of the, the learning is um, addressed more specifically to the heightened levels of anxiety that we have um, societally right now that we've talked about pre-COVID, post-COVID, all those different areas that are um, becoming a hindrance to um, not only students, but families, uh, parents and families um, functioning uh, in today's society, the different stressors, the different things that we have, um, always giving us more inputs than we've ever had before in life. And these things were geared more as a, an awareness tool uh, to learn when you're, when you're dealing with those things, 
what are the triggers that are actually causing anxiety and the steps to uh, bring those anxiety levels down um, in a more, lack of a better word, natural way. Learning through your own, your own uh, mind and everything how to settle yourself so that we don't have these rampant uh, levels of anxiety. Um, a lot of those things are breathing exercises, um, learning how to limit your um, inputs and different things like that. I didn't, there wasn't any part of discussion about, um, and I know anytime you hear about meditation, you, you get concerned about, oh, is this promoting one certain thing? All religions in their core do have meditation as a part of their society. It's part of an ancient concept of just clearing your mind, period. Um, and I think the discussion points that we had in curriculum were all geared on that, is learn clear your mind, tools to identify that, tools to do that, whether it be in school, at home, and different places like that. So it was more the analytical type of steps to realize that and how to calm yourself so that the anxiety levels weren't so high. That, that's what we got from the discussion at the committee level when we talked about it. Dr. Pirano probably hopes it works with the parents. <laughs> I hope it works <laughs> everywhere, right? <laughs> with my own family, my, me. <laughs> but, yeah, but prayer meditation, or meditation is part of prayer in, in almost every, every organized re religion. Uh, you don't have to go far to find that. So uh, we're not promoting a religion, but this is a technique used in, meditation is a technique used in almost all religions, so. Um, and with everything, the, the integration is, is everything. How we, the implementation is everything. I, I have confidence that you're not going to present this uh, from the Buddhist perspective. Um, I mean, the, the evidence is clear that it increases executive function. Um, I do have some uneasiness as well um, for different reasons. Um, uh, saddling our teachers with another, um, uh, an additional, it's a double-edged sword, you know. Uh, I mean, this is going to be a tool that's going to help manage the classroom, but at the same time, there's going to be that curve of implementing it and learning it and implementing it. Um, so, but... I mean, it's a 30-day review, so I, I'm anxious to see it. I have three of my own students are doing their PhD work on MindUp. So I'm, I'm very numbers. curious about how this is going to play out. And that's why um, our goal is to have a parent in each. We want to decide how to roll it out. Um, and I talked to the MindUp representatives in depth about not overwhelming our teachers. Thank because you. That's why we haven't implemented something okay. like this, because everything else I've seen um, dumps in a way onto the teachers. Right. Here's one more lesson to teach. Right. Um, and I think what really appealed to me in this is that replacement, you can't always replace anxiety, but one of the replacement behaviors is gratitude. And finding ways to use our PBIS program to create opportunities to show each other gratitude and to show each other acts of service. Um, if you saw on our um, social media recently, our intermediate school students have um, their day each month where they greet all of their classmates in the buildings and provide them um, fun notes and stickers and positivity. And that's what we're looking for. You know, how do you help students create um, service-oriented, community-driven opportunities that show gratitude and show service to each other. And I think that that's, that's a huge push in this. And so you could really implement it in lots of ways. You can have um, you know, parent nights, you can have community nights, you can have um, assemblies, things like that. So it doesn't have to necessarily be done in classroom lessons. Um, so there are lot, lots of ways we can roll that out, and we can continue to talk about that. But like I said, if anyone has questions, we can certainly bring those reps back um, to talk to us. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? All right, next, uh, Imagine Learning <clears throat> ESL. Um, the Imagine Learning program was brought to us, um, brought to you as the board for a pilot consideration, and we are now asking for um, a purchase program, the uh, 
Students who are English learners are using this as a progress monitoring and intervention tool. It is recommended through the Allegheny Intermediate Unit and it is um, indi individualized for each student who's an English learner at their level and their pace and we've seen great progress with it thus far. Um, this would be paid for out of our Title III ESL funding. Questions, comments? Okay, next, uh, German Exchange Student Program. Mr. Polfio, Dr. Parano. <laughs> so we will be partnering, uh, we're asking for permission to par partner with, with Ventana USA uh, and their parent company in a German exchange program. Essentially what we're asking to have happen is uh, Ventana will sponsor a German student to, to come over to the United States. They will spend one week in our school with for a, with a Franklin Regional student and a, hopefully a Franklin Regional family, and then they'll spend a, a week studying the business at Vantana. Uh, in exchange, our student, or at least one of our students, will, during the summer, when, when the German school, the, the gymnasium school, is in session, our, our student will go over, uh, spend a week in their schools, and then study uh, within the business for a week as well. And so we just want uh, uh, this. That cost will be covered uh, through, through the company, and so we are asking for permission to, one, host, and two, uh, allow our students to go over. This, you said this was with Ventana? Yes, with Ventana. Tony Bali. Yes. Yep. Uh, Chris is spearheading it, but Tony's deeply involved, so. It, Chris. Ben, oh, Chris. Uh, Chris Pauly. Chris Pauly. Yeah, yeah, Tony's son. Additional yeah. questions? All right, uh, we'll move on. Uh, approval for student agreements. Uh, we talked about that in executive sessions for, for a student's placement. Okay. Mr. Matsey, we've got uh, a, couple uh, a couple items here. We'll start with the mitigation support services. Good evening. First up for your approval is the wetland mitigation at the intermediate and the primary campus. Mid mitigation of the wetland areas. Wetland areas. I got them. So essentially, uh, one of the things we increased the wet those wetlands by 125 percent. In the process, there were certain plants that had to be planted. They were planted. Uh, what has happened was it's a wetland area. So as you replanted the as those those wetlands were replanted, cattails uh, which expand tremendously on their own, expanded. Well, they, be, they expanded so much that they impeded upon these they other become points. almost invasive. They became invasive. Right. And so essentially, in exchange for the final review, because there are too many cattails, we would have to cut those cattails out and then maintain that, and it was almost impossible. In exchange for that, uh, we are purchasing, we had to plant some additional plants, and we are purchasing wetland uh, through the DEP. Uh, and so essentially, there is a, actually a cost savings to us through Correct. this process. <laughs> yeah, we'll be purchasing a uh, point. We'll do less, we'll do less, but, pay, but also pay less. Right, you know, it, it, it really always was kind of a puzzlement to me that the DEP thinks that, that man is not as good as God at creating wetlands, so therefore it requires man to create twice as much wetlands as, as were there initially created by God theoretically to, to, to get past them. So if any kind of time you can cut a deal with those people, it's probably a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, because that'll get us out of our agreement with the CEC, and that's where we'll have our savings. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, the general demolition construction contract for Heritage. For your approval for the general deconstruction um, for a base bid of three hundred four thousand, with an alternate bid of eighty. I'm sorry, thirty-eight thousand. For a grand total of three hundred forty-two thousand to be approved here. Can we? Uh, we actually have John, Jonathan Finn here. So if John Finn from HHDSR is here. Uh, we we had a meeting. We had 
very good response from the public. We had over 21 demolition companies and 11 abatement companies there. So we had a big party of 40, 50 people there and uh, going over the building. And I'll turn it over to John now. There must not be enough buildings to tear down here, right? <laughs> get, that, get that kind of response. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, again, yes, my name is John Finn. I'm with the HHS, the Architects Engineers. Thank you for having me here this evening. Just to uh, meet all of you, introduce myself. I, I've been working with HHS, the R for about uh, 18 years now. I'm one of the, I'm the vice president of the Sharon branch. Uh, we also have an office in Pittsburgh as well. So uh, thank you for this opportunity to, to work with all of you. And uh, I'm here to answer any questions you would have about the bids, but I also have a packet, if it would be okay, just to kind of pass that out mm -hmm. and help explain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't need to take up too much of your time this evening. It was a, it was a great process, actually. Um, as Mr. Matsey explained, we did have a pre-bid meeting here on November 3rd uh, and a tremendous turnout at that meeting. There was 21 uh, different companies who came uh, from the demolition side to check out the building. Uh, we also were able to meet with about 11 um, different abatement companies that came in to take a look at it as well. So a lot of attention into the demolition of the school. Uh, which I, we believe led to some very, very competitive bidding and some great pricing that came back for you all. Uh, so for your consideration this evening, uh, I'd like to go through those bids very quickly and just kind of highlight the, uh, the high points of what that is and uh, what we would do moving forward and then answer any questions that you would have. So if you kind of flip through the, this packet here on page two, you can see the, the bids that were submitted for the general demolition. Your low bid, uh, in particular, Rittenauer and Sons Construction Company came in with a base bid of 304,000 and an alternate bid uh, of 38,000. The base bid is the removal of the building as a whole, but we gave them the option to bid that as leaving the foundation walls in place, breaking up the slab in the basement at the bottom, and then filling in on top of that. The walls would be cut down four feet below grade, allowing us to finish the surface uh, to be a grassy area. Uh, but it would be out of the way, essentially. The alternate bid would be the removal of everything, the foundations, foundation walls, uh, all of that cement down at the bottom, and then bringing that up with a uh, compacted fill, and then topping that with some uh, screen topsoil and some seed. Because of that price, I, our recommendation is going to be to, to take that alternate bid. Uh, if you were to pay for that later down the road in some additional excavation, it's going to cost a lot more uh, with, with those foundation walls there. So this would be a, an ad, uh, advantageous move for the district to go ahead and uh, accept that price. So that oh, all-in package for that general demolition, as Mr. Matsey alluded to, was $342,000. Uh, the next page there is uh, on page three is our asbestos abatement bids. Uh, the documents were put together by PSI here in Pittsburgh. They already did a review of the building here and understood the scope very well. So they've kind of put together a package and received a, a considerable amount of bids here, the low uh, being Trifecta Team LLC with a base bid of $119,224 and an alternate bid of 12,000. The alternate bid for the abatement uh, was to provide for a boarding up of the windows after they're removed. There's asbestos glazing compound, it's the caulking uh, stuff around the windows, so that's going to be removed by the abatement contractor. And as an extra line of, uh, line of safety and security for the site, uh, they priced in the, the boarding up of those windows uh, for your consideration. So as the building is open uh, and the windows are out of the way, you have some, uh, some barrier there against the outside. Now the site itself will be contained within a fence. Uh, we'll have our general demolition contractor upkeep that fence through the, through the process. But uh, just this would be an extra, uh, extra lay, layer of uh, security for that building as, as a whole 
through the demolition process. So our recommendation would be to go ahead and take that alternate, uh, but that is there for your consideration as well. But at what point in time will the doors be removed? So the doors will be removed as a part of the, um, the final demolition because the general contractor will want to keep those there. So I imagine the way they will proceed with this is actually bringing the entire building down uh, with an excavator after the abatement is done. Uh, so they would be kind of crushed in the process as opposed to removed. Uh, but if that is something we could definitely, the, the contractor is gonna be responsible for the safety and security of the site. So we'll make sure that they keep them secure at all times as we are on site checking all the process there. Okay. Uh, the next page uh, on page four, would be the bid summary. This is just to kind of highlight what your all-in uh, project costs would be. The general contract number one, a general demolition construction for Rittenauer and Sons with the base and alternate bid as we discussed was 342,000. Contract number two for the asbestos removal, all-in the uh, base plus the alternate bid one would be a cost of $131,224. Your total uh, proposed total construction co uh, contract amount would be $473,224. Now, in addition to that uh, construction cost, there will be some soft costs on top of that. I've tried to highlight those here down below. The MPDS permit, we are disturbing more than an acre, so that has been processed at this point. Uh, so we've got that permit in hand as we move forward. Design fees, some printing and um, utility disconnection allowances and then the permit and zoning with the township uh, we're working through that process right now and then a contingency at five percent uh, so an additional one hundred three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars approximately could be on top of that for a total project cost of five hundred and seventy six thousand nine hundred and seventy four dollars and then to conclude this packet on pages five and six We've gone ahead and talked to both of our bidding uh, successful bidders. We've walked through the scope of work with them. We made sure they understood what they were uh, to do, what the intent of the project was, and had them confirm that in writing. And so we have that here presented to you as we've uh, done that due diligence to make sure that they understood the scope of the work and they were good with their bids. Both of them have confirmed that they are indeed good with their bids and ready to enter into a contract. Um, the last page is just the resolutions for your consideration to award the contract number one for Rittenauer and Sons for amount of 342,000, and then Trifecta Team LLC for the amount of 131,224. With your approval here uh, this evening, uh, if you choose to go forward with this, we'll go ahead and get the letters of intent out tomorrow uh, so that the contractors know to be prepared, to start preparing their insurances, bonds, so forth, and we'll be hitting the ground running here after the new year to try and get mobilizing everything running here. Any questions at all that I can answer for anyone? You're, you're, Go ahead. You were mentioning the fencing. Um, again, for safety, security, uh, how many entrances and exits will there be while you fence the area off? Double check that, if you don't mind. My, my concern is the way people roam around, we don't want people you know, getting in and out without really making sure that it's quite secure. Mm -hmm. We actually have, it looks to be three, uh, three gates. So we will have a gate at the drive in front of the school to enter that drive because we're going to allow the contractor to use that as a staging area as they're demoing the building. And as you would come down through there, uh, we would have another gate to exit. Then we have another area in the parking lot behind the building where it's fenced off and there's a gate there to access in case they would need to drop off some materials or something like that because of the building. They wouldn't be able to traverse around the building so we gave them that additional entrance in the back there. Yes, sir. Uh, my first question, have you, I mean, I assume you're, you've worked with Murraysville here to bond this, you're bonding streets from the school site to 22 or? I'm sorry, what's that? A question about whether you've worked with Murraysville bonding the street between the school. I assume that you're going to take this stuff out down to 22, is that correct? We're going to take the, the access, the 222, I don't think we'll go that far with the demolition. We're just severing it at the actual entrance to the drive in front of the school. So I don't think we'll be into the, the Murraysville street 
uh, I'll say right away, and uh, so I don't know if we'll be actually working with them in any. Murraysville owns both old twenty two. Yeah. And and. Uh, I think Mr. Oh, Young it, it about the trucks traversing. Yeah, the the trucks traversing. bonding road bonding is what I'm. Yes, so that is actually, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's actually covered in the front end of the documents. And yes, the contractor is going to be required to check with all local uh, ordinances to ensure that they uh, meet that requirement. So yes, we'll be following up with the contractor on that. Okay. Sure a My second question is, how do you, as, a, as the project manager, verify that the asbestos ends up where it's supposed to end up in a legal landfill? So we um, actually, HHSDR will not be working with the asbestos in general, uh, that is PSI, and they will be coming on site to verify that the contractor is putting that into the correct landfills. Those forms must be submitted back as a part of the uh, closeout documentation. So we'll be verifying that throughout the construction or demolition in this case, as well as um, at the end of the project to make sure that everything was sorted through appropriately. Okay, and my final question is, you as the project manager looking at the wild range of the bids, mm -hmm. in your professional opinion, because your butt's going to be on the line at some point here, mm -hmm. is, is this bidder, I mean, you know, if you, if you look across from him and, and I'm going to get myself in trouble here, Dr. Perano, because I'm thinking that Advanced Builders is trying to get well right <laughs> here, but you know, just just such a huge difference. It's 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 scary. Yes. That, I mean. That well, so in our past uh, with the demolition projects that we have bid, uh, we have seen some very wide ranges, such as you see here. Um, for instance, another district, uh, we actually had a bid for zero dollars, uh, which came in. So that was uh, a a project where they took it for scrap, but unfortunately there's not enough scrap in this building to be able to accommodate something like that. Demolition is a very tough thing to predict. You don't know why they're bidding the way they do, in my opinion. Uh, they, are, they could have a need to keep their guys busy through the winter. There could be a need to just, maybe they do need some material for scrap. I really, I really don't know why these bids come in the way they do, but the ranges are always seem to be very wide on a demolition project such as this. It's all over the board. But in terms of the bidder that you have now, in talking to him about his process and about what he intends to do with the building and what he intends to do for the demolition, he understood the intent of the documents and understood what was required as a part of the specifications for backfill and what was going to be required for uh, this project in general, and I believe, yes, he is understanding what the intent is with his business. How long has Rittenauer been in this business? Uh, with uh, Moochie Construction here at South Park. Uh, they actually came in and cleaned up a demolition project for us there, and uh, they did some excavations for the South Park School District there. And uh, so I've talked with them about their experience, and they definitely um, have gone through this process before okay. and understand the requirements of what is, what is going on okay. there. Yeah, the, with your many years of experience that you've done, I was just, that was part of my question that Ms. Grant was talking about, too, is what experience have you guys had with that? Because there was a big spread. My concern is that somewhere along the line we don't get a sleeper, and then all of a sudden, oh, well, we made a mistake, and we have to come in with a thing called a change order, which we all know that some people, they bid low for the purpose of getting the deal, and then uh, all of a sudden at the midnight hour, oh, well, we made a mistake, and they come back to the school district and say, well, we gotta jack the price up to be where the number two or three or four bidder was at. So, you know, have you worked with or researched these folks? Because it is a, it's a good, it's a significant spread. For the taxpayers, I will say that this number, if this sticks, is far lower than I thought that initially it would be. So that's a good thing, as long as it stays there. Do you think that this seems like it's So we have had experience with them in the past. They've been a very good contractor. Um, we do not like change orders. Very high. No, no. HHSDR does not like this, those. This, this, this we try to forecast and plan for as many unforeseen conditions as we can. <laughs> if there is an unforeseen yeah. condition, that's something that we have to address. That's just... Uh, 
We'll be working with the contractor to secure the best prices uh -huh. possible throughout the entire process. But our take on this is you're signing a contract. Are yours your own so we expect the intent of the drawings to hold that they will uh, leave this site as a demo you know demolished building with uh, the specified backfill and the specified topsoil and screen uh, seated area and that is the intent of what those drawings are going to show at this point and that's what was reviewed with them and vetted with them after the bid was submitted because okay, again I'm looking at the the alternate bid I mean it makes all the sense in the world to do it and be done however I'm looking at there's some big number spreads, you know, the, from way down in the bottom of the barrel to 10 times the amount of money. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to uh, we want to make sure that if that's what they're going to do, we hold their feet to the fire and hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the line, somebody doesn't come back and say, oh, we made a mistake. Now, I also understand, and Mr. Ann and I have a lot of experience with this, with people that do demolition, there could be a lot of potential dollars mm -hmm. in scrap. I get that, okay? So that's up to them. God bless them if they want to do it for a fair rate mm -hmm. and take care of our taxpayers. And if they can get 10 times that in scrap, good for them. We're just concerned that the cost stays where it is and we don't get hit with a sleeper with a change order. That's my comment. So I guess my, my question to follow up on all this, and it sort of comes down to it's this simple. Uh, when you look at the companies and you look at the the prevailing bidder in each situation, were they uh, the lowest responsible bidder? And do, do we check on the responsibleness of that bidder? Did we or do we, did you say? Did we? Did we? Uh, given their, yes, I would say they are the lowest responsible bidder. Um, they do have, I mean, they are lining up work of similar nature for this winter. Uh, with Brentwood Borough School District as well. So they they are definitely eyeing up this type and this caliber of work in different uh, locations. They So I believe, yes, they understand the, the boundaries of what is presented in the contract documents and what they're going to be doing. Um, based off of what they've described in their process, what they plan to do is crush up a lot of the masonry and concrete and utilize that as the backfill which is permitted by the specifications. He understands that he needs to get that material tested and show us that it is going to meet the specified 2A properties, which is the type of granular size of the material. So he intends to utilize that as his backfill, which will, that could have been some considerable cost savings. Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't comment directly to that because I did not put that bid together for him. Mm -hmm. However, that could have been where he had an advantage over other bidders that were not going to uh, accomplish that process. So as far as the lowest responsible bidder, yes, I believe they are able to accommodate this project. I have one final question. Yes, Since the soft costs approach 25% of the total bid cost, is that number an estimate that, that you will justify and will pay the actual cost of that or? Yes, so they're in the soft cost, the design fee uh, per our agreement was a 6% charge. So that is adjusted off of the 342,000 that will remain at that 6%. I understand the contingency, what yeah. I'm concerned is, for example, as, as my colleague pointed out here, the $50,000 disconnection cost seems that is, to me to be excessive. Yeah. That is an estimate, and so if there is a, um, a fee for the disconnection of the power, so forth and so on, that would be applied towards that allowance, but not necessarily, uh, the power company has not given us a value of the, anything, nor gas or anything like that. So there may not be any utility disconnect fees, that's what we're kind of hoping for, but the contractor is going to set up the disconnect of all the utilities here as a part of the contract, and then we will uh, we will you know, Basically, you got, you've got five utilities. Of course, you've got the gas, water, and electric, and then you have the telephone, and I guess data probably as well. Mm -hmm. And those are pretty pretty small costs. And the big yes. cost, of course, will be the, probably the power, the water, and the gas. But, so, but yes. I, I don't believe they're going to be that big. I would hope not. Yep. Thank you. You all. Any other yeah. questions? I'm sorry. No, you're good. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful holiday, everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right, Mr. Uh, 
matter with the VBH and final settlement? Yes, we have uh, two action items there. Uh, this is all in regards to the um, a building project that has been completed. And these are just authorizations uh, for both uh, the VBH and the advanced builders to finalize all construction documents, all documentation concerning that project, um, finalize all paperwork, and, and uh, settle any uh, outstanding issues. Any questions? <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Delt with the FRIA. Yes, the next two items are, are in regards. The next two items are in regards to MOUs uh, with FRIA. Uh, the first is teacher leader restructuring, and the second is a modification to the elementary coverage compensation, specifically as it relates to the primary building. Any additional questions or comments? All right, thank you. We'll move on to additional agenda items. Uh, personal agenda, Dr. Delt. The attached personnel items uh, are to be uh, requested to be provisionally approved upon submission of the appropriate documentation and other forms required uh, and prescribed by the state and federal regulations. Any questions on personnel? All right, we'll bring Mr. Perry back up for a joint purchasing consortium. Hello again, uh, we're asking the board to ratify the WIU joint purchasing consortium's awarding of fuel bids for the January through June of 2024 period. Um, the, again, the same bidders that are providing the fuel for uh, July through December had the lowest bids. So that would be Mansfield Oil for the diesel at $3.1201 and petroleum traders for the unleaded gasoline at 2.9558. Any questions? Okay. Next, uh, we had a property within the district that was sold from the unsold property repository at the county. So basically property that's accrued uh, quite a few number of years of back taxes to the point that no one will buy it at a sheriff's sale. Um, so basically when it goes into the unsold property repository, uh, the, the tax liens are wiped off and it's just an effort to get the property back onto the tax rolls and they ask for uh, the district to consent to that sale. Questions? Okay. And then finally, uh, and we have our first Action step for the 24-25 budget cycle. Uh, the Finance Committee is recommending that the board approve uh, the resolution to stay within the Act 1 index for the 24-25 year, which is 5.3%. Uh, this resolution does not mean that there will be an increase, only that the increase would be limited to that index of 5.3%. We're operating on an accelerated timeline this year because 2024 will be a presidential election year, so Pennsylvania's primary has moved up. So all our action steps as, re as it relates to the Act 1 timeline are moved up as well. What, what was your actual budget number? I'm sorry? Percent-wise, was less than, I mean, the, the number that you're using is less than the 5.3, is that correct? For expenditures or? Yes. Yeah, it's... I mean, yeah, it's significantly less than 5.3. I mean, we haven't gotten too far into the 24-25 oh. budget process yet, but... My point is you didn't just, just stay just under it. You got under it by... Well, like, yeah. I mean, in the, the past year, we were less than half of what the Act 1 index would have allowed correct. Um, for 23-24. I wanted to bring that point out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. I need a uh, motion to adjourn committee of whole meeting. So move. Second. We got Ed and Bill. We will. <laughs> I'd love to. Do you want to get out of here? All right. I'll, I'll do that. All right. We're going to move right into the regular meeting. Uh, I'll call to order for the.
Franklin Regional, bless you. Bless you. Board of School Directors, regular meeting for Monday, November 20th, 2023. And we will stand to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice, justice for all. <clears throat> Reading of the mission statement, we, the Franklin Regional School community, strive for excellence, learning, achievement, and citizenship in all we do. We were in executive session uh, again from 6.45 to 7.30 for legal uh, <clears throat> safety and contractual obligations. Roll call, Ms. Wolf. Here. 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 Still there? Can you hear you? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we need an approval of minutes for the Committee of the Whole meeting October 23rd, 2023, as well as the regular meeting minutes October 23rd, 2023. I need a motion to approve. So moved. Herb. Second. Vince. Uh, any comments? Hear none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Carries <coughs> 9 0. And I will turn it over to Dr. Prana for future dates and upcoming topics. So on December 4th, we will have our reorganization meeting here at 730, the municipal building. Note that that will only be a reorganization meeting that night. Uh, based upon feedback from, from previous boards, uh, we made the decision that with it, in years that new boards are coming in, having a voting meeting that night when people are just getting acclimated to the, isn't, isn't the best way to do business for, for the new folks or for, for the district. So we will, uh, our next regular board meeting will be in January, but we will have the reorganization meeting as required by law on December 4th, uh, 2023. But then on January 22nd, we will have the Committee of the Whole and regular board meeting. Uh, here at 7.30 p.m. at the Municipal Building. Upcoming topics include curriculum items, personnel, gifts, grants, and donations, and budget transfers. And that concludes my report on upcoming or future meetings and upcoming topics. Thank you, Dr. Perino. Uh, we are going to need an approval. Or approve. So moved. Ed, second. Second. Mark, uh, any comments? Hear none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Carries 9 0. All right, we will move on to we'll need a motion to approve the list of bills. Uh, paid bills, general fund $679,049.61. Athletic fund $14,206.31. Total paid bills of $693,255.92. Unpaid bills, general fund, $963,372.46. Capital reserve fund of $134,321.08. Athletic fund of $28,580.90. $1,890.96 for a grand total of $1,820,146.88. Food services, $257,137.62 for a grand total including food services of $2,077,284.50. Need a motion to approve the list of bills. Herb, second. second. Was that Ed? Or Bill? I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. Uh, any comments? Bill. Any comments? Hear none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? 
Motion carries 9-0. And next, we, there's no public comments for this session. Uh, any solicitor's comments? None for public sessions. All right. So we will move on to the consent agenda motion to remove any of the consent agenda for separate action by any of the members of the board. All right, then we will move to uh, consent agenda items and approval or motion to approve consent agenda items one through 22. I need a, a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Herb, first, second, Ed. Any comments? Hear none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 9-0. Uh, other agenda items uh, that we can uh, move to for approval, um, personal agenda, joint purchasing, and the approval one through three. Uh, any, I need a motion to approve those agenda items. I'll move, Mark. Mark, one, second. Second, Vince. Second. Vince. Comments, hear none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 9-0. And the last one, we will do a roll call vote on uh, action, uh, agenda item four. I need a motion to approve the act to go to the act one index. So move. So move. Okay, we will do Bill and then Herb <laughs> is second. <laughs> and uh, Ms. Wolf, we will go to a roll call vote. Yeah, that one. Yes. Yes. Mr. Azarin. Yes. Dr. Ethel Moreno. Yes. Mr. Wyman. Yes. Mr. Yan. Yes. Mr. Yanlin. Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries. Zero. And uh, I need a motion. We'll one, one more thing. Uh, this evening will be. Uh, the last meeting for, for Mr. Yant, for Mrs. Altieri Hand, as well as Mr. Mitterator. Uh, it's been an honor to, to work with you and, and over the last few years. I want to thank you for your service to our community, to our students, and to our staff. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, we have some certificates as well as, well as a small, another small token. Uh, Mrs. W Ms. Wolf will will hand them to you, but I, I personally want to take the opportunity to, to thank you. And with that, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. In that, with that being said, on behalf of the administrative team, I would like to wish all of you a very happy and blessed Thanksgiving holiday, and not only to the board and our audience, but to folks watching from home and beyond. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brino. And I need a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Bill and Ed. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great holiday. Everybody have a great Thanksgiving.